first question, how's the body feeling after playing all winter? So, uh, good question. I personally have said this since I was really young in the fact that like, I feel better the more that I do. Now, obviously there's like a fine line to the amount, um, that I, that I'm doing. Uh, but I, historically speaking, I've never really felt good when like, say I've taken like an entire day off. Um, I think, you know, it really does come down to a potential placebo effect, meaning that if I tell myself at a young age over and over and over and over and over again, that I feel better, the more that I do, then I'm going to gravitate towards doing more daily and then therefore be like internally convicted that I'm doing the right things to feel really, really good. Could be truth to that. Could not be, but that's just kind of me. Um, but with that being said, my body feels really good. I cut, I got home uh, a week ago today. This, this, uh, recording is on January 30th. I got uh, home a week ago today and I told myself that I was going to take like a week of just kind of being chill, not doing much. And I, I lasted a day. Some people are just built like that. <laughs> I, uh, started training the, the second day I was here and then I just started throwing, uh, on Saturday. So to answer your question, my body feels really, really good, but I also do so many things to make sure that my body does feel good from a recovery standpoint in which you can learn more about my recovery protocols by going to my website and uh, just searching recovery. I have a whole podcast on like the things that I do every single day um, and the routines that I put into place to make sure that I feel really good. So um, G underscore Sutton 25, my body is feeling really good after playing all winter. Thank you for asking. Second question, ever considered to play ball in Europe, Africa, Asia, or Australia? Absolutely. I think one of the, the most beautiful pieces to this game and to this journey that I'm on that kind of goes unrecognized is the fact that this game, like a single game, has taken me so many different places. And I'm as I get older and quote unquote more mature, I learn to appreciate that kind of stuff more. And if this game can bring me to say Europe, Africa, Asia, or Australia, then let's ride. Uh, I am, I am so for like seeing more of the world, seeing how baseball is different, um, uh, from how it's played in the U S. Um, but I will say as of right now, the goal is always to put myself in the best possible position to accomplish my, my lifelong dream of, of playing major league baseball. Um, so I still have that, you know, in, on my mind, uh, with every decision that I make now, if it ever comes to a point where I don't feel that that dream can be captured, so to speak, then I will absolutely leverage the, you know, the remaining years of my playing career, um, to go to different places that I've never played before, um, potentially meet people that I would have never met before without the game. And, you know, in hopes to inspire, motivate, and educate so many different individuals from different walks of life. And that's kind of the goal of, you know, why I started what I started. So, um, for sure. All right. Third question, Nicholas dot Williams underscore wants to know, or I guess he doesn't really want to know. It's more of just a comment statement. I'm striding out farther and it helped command, but I'm not bringing the back leg through side note is, is it further or farther? Because that's something that's gotten brought up a lot lately. And I've always thought it was further, but it's farther is the word. I just never know the context. Whoa. Anyways, starting out farther and help command, but I'm not bringing. So I think what potentially helped the command, one of two things, mental emphasis on something drastically different than just command, right? So if you're like consciously thinking, I'm just going to stride out farther, it takes away that, that mental potential restriction that is, oh, I got to throw a strike. And it creates a little bit more athletic freedom within your body, which allows you to repeat and accomplish the task of putting the ball where you want. That could be one. Two is the mechanical slash physical response of you're probably striding out further, probably getting uh, a lot more shoulder, trunk flexion, extension, um, and simplicity, simplicity, you're, you're just closer to home plate, right? Um, the, the thing that I do want to point out 
and I just did an analysis client. We talked about the same thing, um, that there's a difference between like, I'm going to stride out longer. Or I'm just going to stride far and like unauthentically forcing a stride length which I think will throw off the entire alignment, the, the entire positioning of uh, the body, you know, throughout the delivery at, at certain key points. Um, and I, I also see like a very unauthentic acceleration thing that, that happens a lot. You can check more of this context out on my YouTube channel, but uh, I, I do see a lot of guys that, that emphasize striding further, striding farther, um, and then kind of pulling their drive leg out of the equation early because they're forcing that stride with their lead leg. And remember, and this is what you can search on my YouTube channel is, um, the, the drive leg is the gas pedal. The lead leg is the brake pedal. When we try to force acceleration and force stride length with our lead leg from a biomechanical standpoint, I think it's going to throw a lot of things off. Um, when you do come down to that anchor point with that lead foot into the ground, and then that could be potentially a reason of which, why you say that you're not bringing the back leg through. Um, but that's pure speculation. If you want to book an analysis and we can really hammer home that, that concept and, and figure this thing out so we don't have to guess do so the slash analysis. Next question. I think this is the fourth question. Um, Marshall's rambling <laughs> wants to know counter rotation is helping me get separation, but making it hard to see target tips. That's funny. You mentioned that dude. Um, I just completed a chapter in my book on trunk rotation mechanics in which I was talking about trunk counter rotation. Is it good or is it bad? So I will never say like one thing is, is completely 100% absolute wrong or hundred percent absolute right. When it comes to pitch mechanics, because I think, uh, deep down, like we kind of determine what mechanical efficiency is for our own self, if that makes sense. But I, I will say, um, I see a lot of guys trying to force counter rotation of their trunk, which is then causing almost a cervical rotation restriction that is then compensating for like an over aggressive rotation of the upper half, right? Because the brain and the body are extremely smart and adaptable to the environment. The, the brain knows what the task is. It's signaling to the body how to complete that task to the best it knows how. So when you force like a counter rotation, and when I say force counter rotation, I, I, I kind of am leaning towards the meaning of like a forcing like a lot of trunk counter rotation. When you do that, you're obviously going to be limited to what you can see with your eyes because your, your neck can only rotate you know, so much. And we live in a media day and age where a lot of people are, are on their phones like this and they're, you're just naturally probably going to have, you know, poor cervical rotation. So when that happens and then you get into your drive phase, your brain at some point has to signal like to your body, like, yo, we got to freaking go. Like we got to rotate so we can actually see where this thing is going. We got to see where we're expressing this energy. So that's, what's going to then that send that signal of like, Oh, we got to go. And, and I've seen a lot of times where, you create early counter rotation, which then gives you a window of segmentation and separation, creating stretch, but it kind of all goes for not because you create that segmentation, you create that stretch before you anchor down into the ground. So separation created before anchor point is kind of useless energy, so to speak. Um, now, Marshall, I'm saying all this without seeing you throw. So don't take that as absolute, um, because it could be a great thing. And maybe I guess a whole nother talking point to this question is the fact that like, I don't know if you, I don't know if I believe that you do have to see the target. Uh, Cause I, I, I believe that like, if you do it enough times, your body knows how to do it. And like Greg Maddox always threw bullpens with his eyes closed. Like obviously visually it, it, <laughs> it helps, but I could do a whole segment on like picking up the target late, taking your eyes away from the target for a set amount of time helps your command, all these different things. It's all about what works for you and, and implementing those things to see, uh, see that on your own. But that's what I got for trunk counter rotation. And that will be more talked about in my new ebook. All right. Fifth question. D Gorman 48 wants to know, could hips not being rotated at landing cause poor lead leg block? thousand percent. Um, again, I did a chapter in my book recently on lead leg block mechanics, and there's a lot of kind of variables to what determines or what makes a, 
an efficient lead leg block, but I do believe that, not to put a number on it, but a lot of what makes an efficient lead leg block is just positioning, alignment, and the timing of that position and alignment. Um, making sure that you know your pelvis is at, at, at a particular point, positioned in a, in a particular way. You can see a lot of lead leg block breakdowns are almost just disguised at, or um, disguised as lead leg block breakdowns, but they're real, in the reality of things, they're, it's a breakdown of something happened before the lead leg anchored into the ground to then cause a misalignment, um, suboptimal posture and positioning at, you know, a, of the wrong time. You know, you don't maybe landing in too much knee flexion, landing in not enough knee flexion, your hips aren't rotated, pelvis is in the right position to rotate over the femur. Um, the lead leg is, is over rotated to make that, that rotation kind of, um, forced, there's a lot of different things, and that is definitely one of them. I have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel of like uh, mechanical screenings with clients in which I'm sure there's a lot of them consisting of something very, very similar to a lead leg block breakdown as a byproduct of something that happened within hip rotation mechanics. Good question. Golden dot Grant. That's just a dope name. G squared um, wants to know, I bought an analysis from you. Could I send you a vid of me now and tell me how it looks? So I have a special discount code for individuals that have already been an analysis client of mine for you guys to purchase a follow-up analysis um, at a much discounted price. So the robbyrosho.com forward slash ask, tell me that you're an analysis client. Um, and then just request the discount code. We'll get you, get you going again. J underscore Andres nine, two, one wants to know most difficult pitch to throw question mark, question mark. And I will give the answer. Probably no one wants to hear, but the most difficult pitch to throw is the pitch that you're not convicted in. If you're not convicted in a pitch, it's the most difficult pitch to throw. Oh, my guy, Brent. Gillespie wants to know, have you found that back foot sliders to lefties are as lethal as change-ups these days? I'm assuming change-ups to lefties. Um, so back foot sliders, I would say, I think sliders in general, as we kind of dive fully into the realm of data analytics and having, you know, all these number, these quantifiable like statistics, we're seeing that the slider in general is just the highest percentage pitch to then induce a swing and a miss for in, in that sense. Absolutely. For me personally, um, I talked about this on my, uh, recent podcast of breaking down my winter ball performance. I haven't had like a potential back foot slider offering for quite some time. <laughs> it's literally been since the 2020 winter ball season. So there'd be times in games where I'd try to throw that back foot slider to lefties. And for me personally, it was not lethal because it's early predictable loopy break. Um, but if you're somebody that has that gyro hard late teeth bite slider absolutely but at the same time if you're a guy with a change up you know that could throw it arm side and has good fade to it um then you know 100 percent. but for me personally uh, i would actually gravitate toward my slider being used against lefties via the the back door or throwing the change up but i do love a back foot executed slider swinging over the top punchy uh, more than most people it just doesn't happen a lot. I, that's probably why I love it so much is because it, I, I don't get it a lot. <laughs> Deegan27 underscore wants to know, are you trying to get in the big leagues? Yes. I said that earlier in this Q&A in which I talked about like my overarching goal, which is actually just more of a overarching dream. Uh, and I owe it to myself to put myself in the best possible position to capture this dream uh, of being in the big leagues. And yes, I get a lot of questions regarding like, are you trying to get in the big leagues? Like uh, you're trying to play MLB. Yeah, I am. I don't know what it is that I do that that um, makes people perceive that I'm not trying to do that. But that is the dream. That is the goal. And uh, that is your answer. Uh, T Dubs 54 wants to know what's a good way to not open so early. Um, I'm assuming this is uh, pertaining to like upper body, the trunk rotation mechanics. Um, there's a couple things that that would cause 
the trunk to, to prematurely rotate. For younger guys, 99.9% .9 of the time it's an instability issue. Um, just the uh, the goal and, and trying to accomplish the goal of trunk rotation mechanics staying neutral throughout the entire drive phase is going to be a, an extremely difficult task if you don't have the ability to stabilize a neutral trunk as you move linear you're you're going to want to open up so front side glove side um trunk stability pieces that's that's huge and then um also look at the arm action of itself i think a lot of timing things from a delivery standpoint are initiated from what the individual's arm action is doing so that's a huge thing to look at is is uh i've seen multiple occasions the arm timing at the point in which the hand flips up like above the elbow um is probably going to be the point in time that the trunk is then going to initiate that rotation so if this is happening you know and you're and you're six seven clicks or frames frame rates away from your full anchor point of your front foot then naturally you're just going to open up early so i would encourage you to play around with some arm action progressions you can find all of like my drill progressions on my youtube channel they're literally just there for you guys um and then uh i think the biggest one would probably just be overloading the front sides front size front side so counterbalancing the glove arm and uh, over over emphasizing that stability since majority of us lack that glad crane wants to know i need tips for sliders i feel like i lost mine recently and can't find seem i can't seem to find it dude 100 percent. i agree with you and i sympathize with you because like i just talked about earlier with my slider is it's it comes and goes i think the most important thing that i wish i did better at an early age because honestly my slider was probably best when i was like 18 19 and i wasn't even really thinking about all these deals with it i was just kind of throwing it um was like jotting down some just personal notes of when it is good like what are the things that you're feeling what is the feedback that you're getting at release like what are these things that you're kind of doing to entice that that nasty pitch um but for me, the slide, like the biggest message I'd get across within this particular question is when people kind of come to the understanding of their slider being lost, right? They lose the feel for it. It's not as good. What they try to do is they try to manipulate it. They try to, they try to do more with it because they know it's good that from a physical standpoint. They try to do more from a physical standpoint, which usually when people, when pitchers try to do more from a physical standpoint, that means doing early, doing those things early. And there's a lot of things within pitching that we actually want to resist doing early. It's like late acceleration, especially with the sliders, you get real cement mixery when you try to, when you try to make a slider slide early so just a simple tip that i could give you pertaining to the slider is a obviously keep it simple um but b late late think late think fastball and then at the last second slider because if you're thinking slider make it nasty make it nasty it's going to be early you're going to get on the side of the ball and then that's how i would perceive you creating like this cement mixer type slider this is all personal experience but i've always had when i've had a good slider when my slider has been the best I get a really gr a comfortable grip that uh, that I don't really have to like sit there and, and while I grip it in a game, be like, oh, this doesn't feel good. You know, like comfortable grip, I think is, is the first and foremost piece. But then um, when I throw it, I feel like I'm throwing a heater. I feel like I'm throwing a heater. I'm letting the grip do the work. I know that's easier said than done, but it's not that I'm like feeling like, oh, my hand is, my, my wrist is supinated and I'm coming around it and I'm doing all this. Like that could be a cue for a lot of successful slider pitchers, but Speaking of personal experience, um, you know, I'm thinking fastball, 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 everything's natural, fastball. And then at the last second, that's when I initiate my slider and I get my fingers kind of around, not so much around, but just on the side and create that side spin on that pitch. It's an angel underscore Santiago 1209, 811209. What is the key to throwing hard? I will say this said it multiple times and I know people hate this answer, but the key to throwing hard is actually wanting to throw hard, being passionate about throwing hard. Why do I say that? Because there's a lot of required work to put in when it comes to velocity, when it comes to just improving, when it comes to getting better at a particular task. And this task is throwing hard in, in the game of baseball, which are extremely difficult things to do. Why do I say that you got to actually want it? You got to love it. You got to be passionate about all these things because that is a foundation that you're creating for it, right? And with the amount of required work that is to do to accomplish that task, it's easy. <laughs> it's really easy with a weak foundation to just crumble and give up. And I know that's the answer. Not a lot of people really care to hear. Um, they want the, the, the one size fits all. They want the pill that 
to take that makes them throw harder. They want the one exercise that they just have to do, you know, a couple minutes a day to make them throw harder, uh, or the one type of mechanical thing that, that, that just accomplishes all their dreams. But, uh, hate to, hate to break it to you guys, man, but it, it's, it's a series of different things. It's, it's, it's a lot of freaking blood, sweat, and tears. It's a lot of hard work, determination, patience, persistence, and passion is your freaking trump card because that is your foundation for why you're doing what you're doing. That's why you're getting up early and working out. That's why you're recovering. That's why you're not eating the McDonald's seven times a day. You know, it's, it's all, it all goes back to that passion and having that passion and having that love for it and, and really wanting to do it and really wanting to throw harder. I know I got deep and philosophical there, man, but it's so true that uh, that is like the most important piece because once you have that, that freaking passion, once you have the foundation for, for the why, then everything else kind of gets easier, right? The work you put in the process you know, that gets easier. It becomes easier because you know why you're doing it. I think a lot of people just do it just to, just because they want to like do it. They don't really, you know, whatever. And, and those are the types of people that uh, I think just, they, they don't put in the, the work that is required to accomplish that particular task. And I don't relate to those people because I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them, they, they, they say they want to, they want to do something, but they're not willing to put in the work. And that's when you can identify, okay, you got to have a better foundation. Talk is cheap on the subject of velocity. You can literally go to my website, therobbyroshow.com, and just search Velocity. I have a ton of content that will help you get better at throwing with Velocity. Also, this ebook coming out is going to be freaking fire flames. All right, that's it for now. Much love, guys.